for African Americans, there was this sense that they wanted to avoid the over-enthusiasm and over-optimism that they had shown during World War I. Many African Americans had approached World War I as finally this will be the conflict in which our patriotism and our loyalty to the United States is recognized, and therefore we can get more rights. But for African Americans, they were solely disappointed, as World War I was followed by a wave of riots and lynchings targeting African American communities and African American veterans of World War I. So World War I had really been the pivot point away from a idea of racial uplift and more towards activism, that protests uh, using the legal system, these were the ways to achieve change. African Americans during World War II, uh, like other Americans, migrate across the United States for war work. About 700,000 African Americans move outside the South to urban areas in the North and the West during the war. In many cases, the rate of African American migration drastically outstrips the rate of white migration in proportion uh, to communities. And this caused a lot of conflict for African Americans because racial segregation, while not on the same level in the North and West as it was in the Jim Crow South where it was legally codified, there were still these things called racially restrictive covenants that were in place in the North and the West. So basically, you could have the deed for a property specify that only white people could live there, for example. And so this made it very difficult for African Americans who migrated into cities like Detroit, New York, and Los Angeles to find adequate housing because they were very much limited to certain pockets, certain African American neighborhoods that were not zoned in a way to be prohibitive to minority occupation. In Detroit and in Harlem and New York City, we see race riots happen in the same summer uh, as the Zoot Suit Riot, so the summer of 1943. Uh, in Detroit, about 33 people are killed in that riot in June of 1943. Uh, in Harlem, that riot in August of 1943 also results in a loss of life. We also see riots in other places across the summer of 1943. In places like Mobile, Alabama, Beaumont, Texas, even one close to home here in El Paso, or rather a near riot, a riot on Fort Bliss essentially uh, results in the death of two soldiers. And this is something I'm currently in the middle of researching. So these riots, these riots were oftentimes sparked by uh, conflict over public space, recreational space, a fight at Bell Island Park um, in Detroit is what eventually caused the Detroit riot there. Uh, in Harlem, it was an allegation of police brutality against an African-American soldier in uniform that sparked the riot. So these waves of riots across the United States, most publicly in Los Angeles, Detroit, and New York, which, which actually was the subject of my dissertation uh, research, these riots indicated that there was a serious amount of unrest on the home front that there was uh, definitely not this let's put all of our differences behind us and work together kind of notion going on, that people still very much held on to old uh, grudges and prejudices during the war. African Americans, as I mentioned, served in segregated uh, units in the service. About one million African Americans will enlist during World War II. Initially, at the beginning of the war, many African Americans were confined mostly to support uh, or service roles within the military, not combat. Uh, 
Um, much like every conflict since the American Revolution, uh, they were segregated into units led by white commanders and again, not expected uh, to engage in combat positions. But this does start to change as we get to the middle of the war. Uh, famously, generals like uh, Patton stated that he didn't care what color his troops were so long as they were good. And I'm greatly sanitizing and editing that Patton quote. For these service members, there was a lot of concern over discrimination. A lot of military uh, base expansion happened in the American South, and so uh, African-American soldiers stationed at these Southern bases very frequently complained about discrimination in the town or the community that the base was located in. Um, we see that in El Paso, there was before the Fort Bliss riot, uh, a concern over discrimination uh, especially in recreational spaces like movie theaters in the El Paso oh. community. Oh, yeah. <sighs> and this was considered such a potential problem, the segregation and discrimination faced by African American service members, that this was a considered a real morale problem and a potential security issue for the American Armed Forces. Secretary of War uh, Henry Stimson even kept a file on um, racial discrimination in the Armed Forces in his personal safe in his office marked top secret. For many service members, the idea of being able to uh, take advantage of the benefits promised by the GI Bill was appealing post-war, but the reality was that African-American veterans did not have the same access to benefits under the GI Bill, in part because banks were far less willing to provide uh, loans and mortgage assistance to African-Americans. African-Americans were also uh, prohibited in where they could buy houses due to practices like redlining and blockbusting, which we'll talk about in our future podcast on the 1950s. And there's also the fact that education, particularly in the South, is still segregated. So many African-Americans were not given equal educational access either. and were told they could only go to uh, African-American schools and that they were limited uh, in their educational opportunities. The civil rights movement continued during World War II. African-American activists were very reluctant to hit pause on activism, and instead they came up with a campaign starting in 1942 called Double V for Victory. So what the Double V campaign emphasized was that there should be a push for democracy to succeed abroad, right? That we're all in on this fight against fascism uh, in the war. However, if we achieve victory in the war, but we don't address the lack of access to rights and democracy at home um, by minorities, then have we really won the war? So this was a commitment to continue to push for more rights uh, for minorities and particularly African Americans during the war. A. Philip Randolph, who was the head of the Pullman Porters, or excuse me, the Sleeping, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, there we go, um, a union representing African American uh, railroad workers, uh, was one of the leading activists. The focus on the civil rights movement throughout the 1930s had been on equal economic opportunities. So focusing on the rights of African-American workers and the Fair Employment Practices Committee uh, that we discussed in our last installment actually happens because of a threat of a public demonstration, a march on Washington, if Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not move to guarantee that there would not be discrimination in employing uh, Americans at war. So A. Philip Randolph threatens this mass demonstration at the uh, National Mall in Washington, D.C. He threatens that African Americans will gather in the thousands to protest if there is not an executive order promising non-discrimination in employment in, in uh, businesses with government contracts. <laughs> 
Now, the March on Washington doesn't happen in 1941 because Franklin Delano Roosevelt does give A. Philip Randolph and activists what they want by creating via executive order the Fair Employment Practices Commission, which prohibits discrimination in hiring and promotion. But the idea of the March on Washington, a very public display at the National Mall, will come back in the 1960s. You probably are familiar with uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, which is given during the 1963 March on Washington. So this idea will be revisited later on. New groups like the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, are founded in 1942 to assist other older groups like the NAACP or the National Advancement, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in pushing for more of these rights. And following the wave of riots that happens during World War II, we do see a willingness by the American public to discuss the issue of race. In particular, um, we have early on um, people like Wendell Wilkie, uh, who wrote in his essay, One World, that Americans could not claim to promote freedom abroad if we did not also promote that freedom for all Americans at home, that we would be rightfully labeled as hypocrites by our enemies if we continued to discriminate against minorities. And in fact, that was a very real threat of propaganda throughout World War II, that the Axis powers did often cite uh, discrimination of minorities and Jim Crow segregation in the South as um, proof that the United States was full of crap. And we do see a lot of cartoons emerging after that wave of riots in 1943, political cartoons by the Axis powers pointing out uh, the uh, amount of help given to the Axis powers by these racist Americans by attacking uh, their brown and uh, black brothers and sisters, to use the family metaphor that was so common during the 1940s. In an episode of very good timing, a Swedish sociologist named Gunnar Myrtle publishes a book called An American Dilemma. Myrtle had actually been hired by uh, the Carnegie Mellon Foundation to work, if I remember the name correctly, uh, to work on a massive study, a sociological study of African Americans in the United States. The study had taken him 10 years to complete. So what good timing that he published his book right after a wave of riots across the United States. Myrtle had been recruited because as a man who was Swedish, he was seen as a white man who was neutral, right? Who was an outsider who could observe uh, the status of American race. Um, Myrtle also, however, did employ a lot of African-American sociologists to do the necessary community studies to get his data. In his two-volume book, Myrtle stated that the Negro problem, as the issue of race had been referred to in the United States, was not that Black people existed, which is oftentimes how the Negro problem was defined, but instead the problem was that African Americans have been denied the full promise and benefits of their rights that had been promised to them by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution passed in the wake of the Civil War. So an American dilemma was really the problem of race and racism in the United States. This was a problem basically created by white people. A racist white people. So when asked, how do we fix this problem, right? How do we address this issue of race, which is tearing our nation apart and harming our productivity in a total war environment? Myrtle suggested the power of education. And this is definitely something that was a big trend, whether it's propaganda by the Office of War Information, which emphasized uh, racial harmony and the contributions of minority groups to the war effort, uh, 
Um, or if we look at a surging demand for educational pamphlets in the wake of these race riots, we see pamphlets like how to avoid a race riot in your hometown uh, and um, leaflets issued by unions about how to embrace non-discrimination in the workplace, there's this overwhelming demand for educational materials that education is the antidote to racism. The idea, though, was that education was going to be the long-term antidote to racism, obviously not something in the short term. And many uh, civil rights activists looked instead in the meantime to form alliances internationally. So we see a series of meetings between World War I and the end of World War II uh, by African uh, colonial territories, activists uh, trying to get independence in these African colonies and civil rights activists in the United States. There was this sense of kinship between African American activists and these anti-colonial activists in Africa that much of their struggles were very similar, despite the fact that, again, we're talking about independence for colonies uh, in the wake of World War II, ideally, in Africa versus gaining more civil rights at home, because there are a lot of similar tactics of segregation, especially if you look at places like South Africa, uh, for example, in the system of apartheid, which looked very similar to the system of Jim Crow segregation in the South. So for a brief period of time in the later, latter part of World War II in 1944 and 1945, there is this very real willingness to talk about the issue of racism and discrimination and how we as the United States can better live up to our founding values of uh, liberty for all, the ability of all Americans uh, to pursue happiness and have a right to life and liberty. That desire, however, uh, to be frank and open about talking about race is going to end with the end of the war. And the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War is going to be the topic of our next installment. Thanks for listening.